So I thought it would be useful tonight to return to uh, basics, sat mind, beginner's mind. And that calls for some definitions that you probably all know. We'll start with these two. Sat. What is sat? Why do we want yoga with sat? Anyone? The real? Hmm? Who said it? The real. The real. Which real? Supreme. The supreme real, which includes all the others. Because the ego's real, real one, which is the real of trauma, is caused by falling into delusion of thinking that you have come into a world in which uh, there are oppressive others and uh, bad karma and situations of uh, no love. And so the real of the ego that it always wants to stay away from and therefore goes into the imaginary and creates narratives of either denial or of sustaining the agony of the unreal that is the, uh, the reason for the trauma. But what causes the trauma to persist is the very defense against it of going into the imaginary. That's the paradox in the Catch-22. And when you are willing and able to observe it, but not identify with it, then the imaginary dissolves and real too appears, and then there is love. Love without a subject and without an object, just love in its purity, which is the emanation of the energy of God and we could say the motivation for the creation of the illusion in order to know God through loving that real, which is one's self that one had temporarily forgotten, but never lost the yearning to return to. And that's the soul's level of the real. And then, of course, Real three is sat. And the real, which is the supreme self, the one self, is not located in time or space, but is eternal, is presence, but without being present, because to the ego, the supreme real is absent because it is unmanifest. And the ego that is a mind split into subject-object perception can never see or find the real, the sat, the self, because the self never becomes an object. The self is the absolute knower, but the knower who is never different from the known. This is non-duality. The unmanifest, and the manifest are not two. Nirvana is not different from samsara. The difference is caused by the fall into the imaginary construct, which comes about through the chit jada granti. Remember the famous term of Ramana? Granti means a knot, <clears throat> the consciousness. Uh, by identifying with the inert body, the jada, which is a corpse when the consciousness leaves, it's just material and it is brought to life by the presence of consciousness, but once the consciousness is knotted to it with an identification, then the realization of the supreme real is no longer accessible. And the untying of that knot is what Sat Yoga is about. So, Sat. The absolute real. Yoga is 
the release of all defenses against being reabsorbed into sat. That's all it is. The word is often defined as union, but there can be no union because there was never duality in the first place. That's the illusion. And so it's the release of the defenses that prevent the obscuration of the truth of non-duality, that one never left. It never really happened. The ignorance is only in a dream. It's not real. The world is a dream field and has no essence, no reality, except that it is pervaded by the supreme intelligence, the one consciousness that is all-encompassing and all-pervading. But when there is identification, the not with a particular individual bodily entity, then that is obscured. It's never lost because non-duality never becomes duality. But it is distanced from consciousness. And then the ego that is knotted to the body out of its fear of death, because then God, the real, means the death of its identity and its life and its addiction to jouissance, to trying to find some gratification to compensate for all the suffering and all the trauma, lead to a constant uh, wheel of uh, repetition of traumas punctuated by moments of gratification after which there is usually disappointment or guilt or shame or all of the above and uh, a sense of, no, that wasn't what I was looking for, and then onward into deeper lostness in the labyrinth of one's own mind. So to get out of this trap, we have to release those... Uh, defenses against freedom because the ego is terrified of freedom, terrified of the infinite, terrified of the madness of the deep, terrified of not knowing who it is, terrified of losing touch with the figures of attachment that give it the illusion of security. All of that and more make up the defenses of the ego against its own liberation. So the way to get there has to begin with the seeking of peace because the ego is in a state of agitation and it's in a state of constant mental chatter. There's never any inner peace. So <clears throat> the key concept for us is Shanti. Now, shanti means peace, yes, inner peace, but it also means more than that. It means silence, inner silence, the end of narratives, a mind free of thoughts. And again, the ego becomes extremely anxious when one has stayed in a thought-free state too long, unless one's in deep sleep. That's the only time uh, one can tolerate being without thoughts. <clears throat> and even then, it, deep sleep is interrupted by dream thoughts. So the real question is, can you tolerate shanti, peace? Can you even tolerate relaxation in your body? 
because it means letting go of certain contractions that are also often suppressing somatized, traumatic memories that you never want to see. They're too unbearable, never want to know are there, never want to process. And you prefer bodily symptoms to having to face unbearable emotions. And so this is the, uh, the reason why Shanti itself, which you would think is a state so easy to reach, it's the way to get to liberation, but no, even Shanti requires, well, it requires first going through and completing what we quaintly call ego death. <clears throat> now, there's not really any such thing as ego death because the ego was never alive. It's a program. It's a self-image. It's a set of uh, uh, belief systems that algorithmically get projected upon the dream field. And uh, it is a, a set of uh, subconscious, usually, fantasies that want to get acted out. And uh, it's a set of internal figures, inner child, superegos, uh, often various other fragments. None of it is real. None of it. There's no inner child. You could do an autopsy on your body, and you'd not find there was never any inner child there, nor a, a superego. It's a delusion. It's your own mind creating its hell realm, because it enjoys it. It's attached to it. It doesn't want to let go into the silence and the emptiness and the freedom. It wants to hold on because if it doesn't hold on to all of that, it can't hold on to a sense of really existing in the world. And that leads to a kind of depersonalization. If I start to feel I don't really exist, then if you're in the ego mind, one begins to feel in a, like we're in a very surreal, more than twilight zone kind of situation <clears throat> that becomes also unbearable because the subconscious traumatic elements uh, show up as parts of the world. The dream field itself becomes a nightmare, or that's what at least one is afraid of. Actually, the nightmare will end in the state of Shanti, but the fear is, no, it will then never end because I can never get back once I've let go, right? So letting go is the last thing the ego will allow itself to do. So Shanti itself, is problematic. <clears throat> so I'm sure all of you remember the, uh, the stages of facing death uh, uh, listed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross long ago, right? 